Good evening, I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Woman's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Woman's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Healthy Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey always strives to improve your well-being through health education. Tonight's discussion is very timely because February is Heart Disease Awareness Month. According to the American Heart Association, Heart disease remains the leading cause of death among women. According to the CDC, about one in 16 aged 20 and older have coronary heart disease, the most common type of heart disease. But did you know that 80% of cardiovascular disease cases could have been prevented? Tonight, we are pleased to welcome cardiologist, Dr. Sabra Luz, who specializes in heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and congestive heart failure. So please use the Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to Dr. Lucy, who will respond during the last 20 minutes of tonight's conversation. Our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. And I wanna take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for their production assistance. You can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Sabra Luzzi. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you. It is really a pleasure to be here this evening with A Woman's Journey. Um, my hope is to give us all a, a, an intro into um, women's heart health, and maybe there might be some surprises along the way in terms of tips to reduce our, our risk overall. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I am a heart failure physician, and so my lens is really um, in terms of seeing patients and individuals um, with very advanced heart disease, really heart failure. And if we could prevent the majority of those cases, um, then we could really do a, a good for all of mankind. So in terms of what we're gonna be covering uh, this evening, we'll talk about the scope of cardiovascular disease in women, and we're gonna characterize risk of cardiovascular disease in women and spend some time on traditional risk factors, sex specific risk factors, and the intersectionality of risk factors and what that means. And then we'll spend some additional time on how we modify our risk as women um, in terms of preventing cardiovascular disease. So in terms of the scope of cardiovascular disease, this is something for us all to really take to heart and to pass along in conversation to um, our communities, our churches, our, our friend groups, our book clubs, because awareness is something that um, we all have a role to play in. So cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women. In fact, one in three deaths each year are attributable to it. It kills more women than all forms of cancer combined. Uh, just under half of women who are over the age of 20 have some form of heart disease, and that includes hypertension. But fewer than half um, really understand that it's their greatest risk when it comes to cardiovascular disease. When we look at survey data comparing women today to women 10 years ago in terms of their awareness about cardiovascular disease, recognizing the symptoms of a heart attack, women today are less likely to recognize those symptoms. And that tells us that we've fallen short in terms of um, our efforts for awareness. Um, and those women tend to be younger women and women in um, uh, multiple uh, uh, diverse communities. And so the, the voice about what needs to happen for cardiovascular disease really needs to be expanded. Fewer than 50% of women entering pregnancy in the United States have ideal heart health, making cardiovascular disease the number one killer of new moms. And women have higher risk of stroke death and disability, um, which is uh, something that is certainly concerning. So as a woman, we know that we are less likely to receive bystander CPR, that means in the event of a cardiac arrest, if someone were to collapse or pass out, a woman is less likely to have a resuscitation attempt by someone in, standing by her in the community. Women are less likely to sur survive a heart attack or stroke, and that's for a, a multiple number of factors, 
uh, less likely to be treated for heart attacks, less likely to be treated in the ideal time frame, which we call the ideal door to balloon time of 90 minutes, less likely to receive upfront and immediate imaging for stroke symptoms, and less likely to get what we call TPA or something that can break up a stroke in progress. Women are less likely to be transported to the hospital by emergency medical services, less likely to receive a defibrillator when it's indicated to save their life, less likely to receive evidence-based therapies for cardiovascular disease. Women are less likely to be included in cardiovascular clinical trials, which really are the framework and how we decide about these therapies and um, the effectiveness of these therapies and the dissemination of these therapies. And women are less likely to be diagnosed with heart disease. And when we think about um, where are we falling short, where are the gaps? When um, medical trainees were surveyed, 70% of medical graduates reported that they had no or minimal sex-based medical training. Um, only 22% of primary care physicians indicated that they felt extremely well-prepared to assess cardiovascular disease in women, and less than half of cardiologists felt extremely well-prepared. And that's based on the Women's Heart Alliance nationwide survey. So when we talk about sex-specific differences in cardiovascular disease, we're talking about potential differences based on sex and gender and clinical presentation, pathophysiology of disease, the actual way in which we diagnose the disease, and sometimes even the response to treatment. Most of these studies um, uh, that have been published define um, sex at birth, and that's uh, and what we'll discuss moving forward. So the feminine face of heart disease, this was um, published just yesterday by uh, our champion of women's cardiovascular health, uh, Dr. Nanette Langer. In this, she identified the specific types of heart disease that affect women. So we know that, as Kelly had mentioned, uh, ischemic heart disease definitely affects women. But heart disease can take several different forms in women. It can be the obstructive type, atherosclerotic obstructive disease, as you see an example of one of my patients in her coronary angiogram to the left of the screen, where she had a, um, a ST elevation myocardial infarction, uh, a blockage in one of her vessels that had to be opened up with a stent. But women are also more likely to present with a heart attack without obstructive coronary disease, a process called MANOCA. Um, and this is related more so to um, issues and dysfunction in the small vessels as opposed to the big epicardial arteries. Women are more likely to present with tears in their coronary arteries, which is called spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and that can happen in pregnancy. Um, hypertension is commonly affects women. Heart failure with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction being the most common um, heart failure uh, syndrome within women but also women have um, uh, unique heart failure risk factors, which we'll get into. Atrial fibrillation certainly affects women. Stroke, as we have just started to talk about, has higher um, prevalence and morbidity in women uh, and peripheral artery disease. And then the specific fields of cardio obstetrics in which there are diseases of pregnancy and cardio oncology in which chemotherapeutic agents used to, uh, to treat primarily breast cancer may have um, implications for heart health and heart disease. So in the words of Dr. Wenger, she said uh, in her most recent publication, requisite is a cultural shift in cardiovascular disease with the presumption that symptoms in men are the implicit gold standard and cardiovascular symptoms in women are atypical although they are typical for more than half of the world's population. So we hear this in our training that women present atypically. Um, however, with women having such a high burden of cardiovascular disease, it being their number one killer, it's not atypical at all. What are those symptoms in terms of heart attack symptoms in women? Well, it can be an uncomfortable pressure, a squeezing of fullness or pain in the center of the chest, pain or discomfort in both arms, Chest pain, yes, it is the most classic symptom from a heart attack for men or women. Women, however, can more commonly present with some of the additional symptoms in terms of shortness of breath without chest pain or breaking out in a cold sweat, nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, um, back pain. That's a gnawing back pain. Uh, so it's important to recognize that all of these things can be part of a heart attack syndrome. It's also important to recognize that 
these other processes that I talked about with regards to ischemic heart disease, whether the vessel is blocked or it's not blocked, can present some similar symptoms for women, or if the vessel is torn, can present some similar symptoms for women. So making it critical that when these symptoms do occur, that you have to be seen and evaluated so we know what is going on and exactly how to address the problem, which is different um, for, for each underlying issue. In terms of atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation is um, uh, often described as an irregular heartbeat, which comes from a disorganization of the electrical signals in the atria. Women have lower prevalence of atrial fibrillation in men, but it still en en ends up impacting about 25% of women in, in their lifetime. When women do have atrial fibrillation, they have worse symptoms, increased risk of stroke and mortality. And what are those symptoms you may ask? It might be palpitations, lightheadedness, dizziness, could all potentially be symptoms related to atrial fibrillation. Older women um, are uh, more often undertreated or untreated with anticoagulation. Anticoagulation or blood thinners are the way that we prevent stroke risk that is associated with atrial fibrillation. And sometimes that's due to inappropriate perception about fall risk or frailty within this um, category of patients. Women are less likely to undergo rhythm control treatment than men. Um, and among individuals who do undergo rhythm control treatment, meaning being on a therapy and medication strategy to get someone back into normal rhythm, um, women are less likely to have the procedures to get them back into normal rhythm in comparison to men being electrical cardioversion or catheter ablation. And when we know that there's benefit to being in that normal rhythm, getting someone back into normal rhythm after they've been in atrial fibrillation for a shorter period of time, then that there goes to, to show us that disparities already start to form with regards to women's outcomes. When it comes to heart failure, at 40 years of age, the lifetime risk of developing heart failure for both men and women is about 20%. Um, and we see that risk increase with age in, in, in both men and women. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is uh, the growing cause of heart failure across the board, and women tend to be more affected by that. What does that mean? That means the heart squeeze function of the heart may measure in the normal range above 50%. However, the uh, symptoms of shortness of breath, leg swelling, uh, abdominal bloating, and just extreme fatigue or um, inability to really tolerate exercise and exertion um, uh, underlie that heft heft syndrome, as we call it. Women are less likely to receive therapies for their heart failure, less likely to receive defibrillators in the case of heart failure, less likely to receive something called CRT or cardiac resynchronization therapy, even though the data has shown us that women may be better responders to the therapy, um, just less likely to receive it. Though women have equivalent risk for heart failure, they tend to have less um, um, uh, to, to receive fewer heart transplants and left ventricular assist device therapies. And to keep in mind that heart failure can be from a variety of different causes in women, uh, pregnancy associated and due to higher burden of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases and uh, collagen vascular diseases, in addition to um, cardiotoxicities related to um, uh, cancer therapies. Um, with regards to valvular heart disease, we do see some dichotomy in terms of um, men and women being affected by um, different types of valvular heart disease more predominantly. Women tend to be more impacted by mitral valvular disease um, in terms of mitral valve prolapse or backflow across that um, uh, mitral valve that sits between the top and bottom chamber of the heart. Whereas men may often present with um, diseases of the aortic valve. What we do know, uh, again, is this similar story in valvular heart disease, as we've heard in heart failure, as we've heard in ischemic heart disease, is that there's underrepresentation of women in research. We don't have um, a, a great specification of sex-specific disease criteria when it comes to valvular heart disease. There may be under-recognition in severe cases, delayed referral for intervention, um, greater symptom burden in women, and thus that leads to poorer outcomes overall. So let's talk about the traditional risk factors. This is what we've commonly heard about. We know that high blood pressure is a risk factor. Diabetes is a risk factor. 
elevated cholesterol levels or dyslipidemia, so a risk factor. Family history is a risk factor, which we will talk a bit about. Um, smoking could put us at increased risk, physical inactivity, poor diet, and um, overweight and obesity. Hypertension um, uh, is a truly important one to take note because hypertension accounts for one in five deaths among American women. It poses a greater burden um, for women than men and then is among the most important risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And we see as women um, uh, are, are over the age of 60 that, that hypertension is, is really um, a pervasive um, entity. Hypertension is called the silent killer for a reason. Um, and when we consider hypertension's impact, we really need to think about its impact across a woman's lifespan. So yes, there can be cases of um, teen or adolescent forms of hypertension that actually has a long-term impact for someone's downstream cardiovascular risk as an older adult. We have to think about hypertensive diseases of pregnancy, um, hypertensive diseases that are uh, present after um, menopause or an older age. Um, all of these factor into uh, someone's lifetime risk with regards to hypertension. We know that when the blood pressure is elevated and it's not well controlled for a longer period of time, that can result in actual structural changes to the heart, um, which have impact. And those changes are listed here being um, increased thickening in the, in the heart muscle, dysfunction in the way the heart muscle relaxes, um, increased likelihood for heart failure, changes in the actual stiffness of the heart vessels, um, and then uh, associated risks with other comorbidities being diabetes, uh, kidney disease, um, and, and hypertensive disorders, which we'll talk about. As I mentioned, after age 60, hypertension prevalence is increased in women as, in comparison to men, and this gap is widening over time. Um, and blood pressure control in women over the age of 60 is, is, um, is worse. After age 80, we see that up to 90% of women have hypertension. When we consider sex specific risk factors for cardiovascular disease, this is something that's really important for us to all take note of. Um, it's a, it's a, a happy time of life for very many, but it's also a very challenging time of life in terms of health concerns. And at the forefront of um, uh, recent news has been the increase in maternal mortality in the United States, especially that seen in African-American women in the United States. And so the focus and understanding about uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy is shifting as it should um, to make it a more prime thought for all uh, healthcare providers who see and take care of women. So in terms of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, they can confer specific risk for women preeclampsia being one of them. We've seen an increase of 25% in preeclampsia over the last two decades. Um, and uh, that has direct impact in terms of increasing cardiovascular risk for women um, long-term. Women have increased risk for cardiovascular disease if they've had preterm deliveries, if they've had gestational diabetes, um, infants who are at the extremes of birth weight, either low or high, or previous miscarriages. Other sex-specific risk factors that can increase a woman's risk for cardiovascular disease long-term could be the early onset of um, their menstrual cycle, hormone replacement therapy, as we've talked about, history of chemotherapy or radiation therapy, which could um, uh, impact um, uh, coronary vessels as well, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and inflammatory and autoimmune disorders, which women tend to have a higher burden of, as well as depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. These factors can um, impact the onset of hypertension of a cardiovascular disease long-term. So we've talked about um, traditional risk factors and you'll see in this schematic that's in the panel to the left. Um, and we've started to talk about pregnancy related risk factors in which um, there are sex specific um, uh, uh, risk factors that occur uh, with pregnancy that put women at a higher risk long-term cardiovascular disease and other female specific um, risk factors that can occur. Now these are all coincided. These are all occurring together and that can put women at 
an accelerated and increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But when we talk about intersectional risk factors for cardiovascular disease, that's really looking at not only um, a woman's individual risk in terms of her medical history or her pregnancy history, but her environment around her, what we call the social determinants of health, where she lives, where she works, her neighborhood, her built environment, um, what she has access to in terms of food or entertainment or health care, um, what she has access to in terms of financial resources. These social determinants of health have significant impact in um, increasing or decreasing that cardiovascular risk, even with the, across the span of these traditional risk factors and these sex specific risk factors. And so this schematic, I think, brings this to light in which social determinants of health, cultural issues, um, uh, even issues with regards to um, language and literacy in terms of uh, barriers and access to healthcare, all of these can contribute to um, increased risk factors for some women when it comes to cardiovascular disease. Well, what do I mean by that? So we have seen in the US that there is a disparate impact of cardiovascular disease in women. We've seen that black and Hispanic women have the highest prevalence of the traditional risk factors and that black women have the highest prevalence of cardiovascular disease overall. If you see in the panel to the left, um, in the, uh, the multi-scheme colored here, red is diabetes, uh, purple is elevated cholesterol, green is hypertension, blue is overweight and obesity, and demographic groups of women are below on the x-axis. We see that Black women and, and Hispanic women suffer from high rates of cardiovascular um, risk factors. Cardiovascular disease also is deadliest in Black women, and it occurs earlier in life. And so um, the awareness about the potential risk um, is something that has to be elevated across all communities. Black women also have the highest maternal mortality. And what often comes up in conversation, and what often comes up in research is the concept of stress. And I think stress is something that we um, are, are still um, looking to learn more about as a cardiovascular community, but one form of stress that um, contributes to social determinants and structural determinants of health could be in terms of experienced racism. And, and uh, just this week, uh, a study was published showing that perceived experiences of racism did uh, contribute to a higher incidence of coronary heart disease among Black women studied over a long period of time. So when we talk about the social determinants of health, it's helpful to remember um, that environment matters. And so this was a study that investigators, um, they had examined the relationship between neighborhood level food access and walkability. How walkable is your neighborhood? How likable, likely are you able, going to be to get physical activity? Um, and what was the impact on premature cardiovascular death um, at census tract levels? This was in Atlanta. And they found that census tracts with high concentrations of minority populations have higher levels of poor food access, poor walkability and premature cardiovascular disease mortality. And this really highlights how social re resources directly impact cardiovascular health. So when we talk about um, uh, cardiovascular disease being preventable, not only is it preventable on an individual level, but on a societal level, we should rethink um, how cardiovascular disease is, risk is conferred. This is another study that looked at neighborhood deprivation and the history of redlining, and that showed that um, cardiovascular health scores um, among uh, adults were worse in neighborhoods that had historically been redlined. Again, speaking to the fact that uh, cardiovascular risk um, tracks with the social, de social determinants of health, and this is something that potentially is modifiable. Again, where you live matters. So the American Heart Association recently issued a, a statement and a call to action about the risk of women living in rural communities, um, people living in rural communities and, and highlighted women living in rural communities, and that the risk of coronary artery disease death um, has significantly increased. When we talk about the last decade, that risk has cumulatively increased by 11% and the life expectancy gap um, is quite significant in rural communities. So again, where someone lives and the access that they have to healthcare, the access that they have 
to um, uh, high quality treatments for their cardiovascular disease, the access that they have to preventative measures for their cardiovascular disease really has a big impact. So let's talk about how we can modify this risk. So we started this evening by saying that 80 to 90% of cardiovascular disease is preventable. 80 to 90% of cardiovascular disease is preventable. This is something that gives me great joy as a heart failure physician because, uh, you know, though I love seeing patients, I would love to eradicate heart failure. Um, and so if we could prevent 80 to 90% of disease, what a triumph that would be. This schematic is an ad adaptation of uh, the American Heart Association's Life Essential Eights, which gives us a framework to consider how to modify cardiovascular risk. And it also um, combines um, risk specifically for women um, as they are um, transgressing from their uh, pregnancy through their postpartum period and allows us to think about modifying risk across the lifespan of a woman. And that's really where our attention needs to go. It's not just uh, 65 and older or 50 and older. It is really considering modifying cardiovascular disease risk for a woman across her entire lifespan. So the first tip is you have to know your numbers. Plain and simple, you have to know your numbers. First number that we come to is blood pressure. Um, this chart gives uh, um, a breakdown of normal through elevated blood pressure and what we consider to be um, in a, a dangerous range or hypertensive crisis and how to, um, uh, to measure that blood pressure. This is the primary number that you have to know uh, to modify your cardiovascular risk with a goal of blood pressure being around 120 over 80. In terms of knowing your numbers, the next number to know is your blood sugar. Um, your blood sugar will often be checked by your doctor as a fasting blood sugar. Um, that means you can't eat, um, but it may also be checked in, in another way in terms of a, 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 a collective measure of blood sugar over several months. And we use this to determine um, uh, if someone is at risk for diabetes or prediabetes. And diabetes directly impacts your cardiovascular disease risk. Um, and stroke risk. And so it's important to know your blood sugar number. Even having a um, pre-diabetic range glucose tells you that you need to be aggressive in terms of risk factor reduction um, in, in that person. In terms of knowing your numbers, the next number to know is your cholesterol. We have to understand our cholesterol and we have to understand what factors into our cholesterol. Now I say this, that um, there are some people, as we talk about family history, there are some people who uh, have a, a genetic predisposition to higher cholesterol. Um, and for those cases of people, there may be um, different medications that we have to consider or different approaches to lowering the cholesterol. If that is not um, the, the category that uh, you fall in, it's still important to know your numbers though, um, in terms of your good cholesterol, your bad cholesterol and how we modify them. Um, we modify them in terms of our diet and our activity level. And then in certain cases can be considered for medications to help modify these cholesterol levels. Uh, the fourth number to know is your weight and your BMI collectively. Um, body mass index, it's a helpful barometer to um, discuss uh, uh, um, um, weight. It's not uh, necessarily the only means in which we can discuss healthy weight but optimal BMI is um, around 25. And we like to uh, use that to assist and inform with regards to cardiovascular risk stratification. Tip number two is know your rhythm. So we talked about atrial uh, fibrillation before being a disorganized um, electrical signal. And, and that can manifest as fluttering, palpitations, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, as we talked about. Sometimes these symptoms are waxing and waning. Sometimes they're not really noticeable at all. But if you do have those symptoms, it is important to have an exam and an electrocardiogram um, to know your rhythm and your risk for atrial fibrillation. If atrial fibrillation is present, then to know if you fall in the category of people who should be considered for a blood thinner to decrease your risk of stroke. Tip number three, so know your history. So this is where um, we can talk a little bit about um, family history and the role of genetic, excuse me, genetic testing. 
as a heart failure provider, um, we commonly see heart failure um, cases that run within families, um, cases where parents had uh, the cardiomyopathy syndrome, grandparents had the cardiomyopathy syndrome. And in those cases, there's a clear cut indication to pursue genetic testing for cardiomyopathy, which we can do, which is a form of heart disease, which we can do. Um, in, in other scenarios, family history may be um, higher risk of diabetes in the family in terms of multiple members of the family, the primary family having diabetes and knowing that that's something that um, requires risk factor reduction. Um, though there may not be a sole genetic test to, to uh, determine that, um, we do have that understanding that there might be increased risk for um, uh, uh, um, developing diabetes as someone ages. In terms of disorders of childhood and adolescence, this is something that's helpful to know with regards to if there are conditions that someone suffered from in their um, early years that puts them at increased uh, cardiovascular risk uh, long-term, any valvular issues, any issues in terms of um, uh, their arteries, their coarctation, et cetera. We consider um, their long-term cardiovascular risk differently depending on uh, disorders and, and diseases earlier on. We've talked about pregnancy-related conditions. Knowing your pregnancy history is critically important. Knowing if you um, had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, to share that information with your internist or primary care physician and your specialist, um, it, it is important. It can make a significant difference in your management and your overall health. And then comorbidity-related risk in terms of um, uh, understanding additional cardiovascular risk that might be associated with an autoimmune condition or chemotherapy agents or other exposures or immune modulators that you may be exposed to for another condition. Tip number four is advocate for multidisciplinary team-based sex and gender specific care across the lifespan. So I, I did touch on this a little bit before, but this gets to the fact that um, earlier in life, if someone may have a hypertensive disease of pregnancy that increases their risk two to four fold for hypertension, two fold for cardiovascular disease. But if the primary care uh, provider never knew the OB history, they're not actively working to modify that. Similarly, if the cardiovascular specialist never asked about the pregnancy history, they're not working to modify that. Um, and so it's very important to try as best we can as advocates for ourselves to have multidisciplinary team care and um, ask and ensure that your physicians talk to each other um, to give you the best counseling in terms of modifying your cardiovascular risk. Uh, gestational diabetes is another example, eightfold increased risk of developing diabetes and then cardiovascular disease um, with that history. Tip number five, better understand your cardiovascular risk and discuss your risk profile intentionally with your doctor. So how can we go about better understanding our risk profile? Well, certainly all of tips one through four in terms of knowing our numbers, knowing our history, knowing our family history, um, uh, knowing our, our sex specific pregnancy related history, all of that factors into it. But then we can also utilize um, uh, additional risk tools to help us better understand our risk of future cardiovascular events. And so most commonly what we'll see used is what's called um, uh, and this is used by physicians or clinicians in talking with their patients about um, their risk for heart disease, having not had heart disease before. Um, they can use something called a pooled cohort equation uh, um, that we've uh, gathered from different population-based studies to determine someone's risk uh, over time. And um, this particular um, uh, risk tool um, that I'm, I'm mentioning it's been well validated. It it, it um, is been guideline recommended, and it does include um, some demographic groups. It includes women, um, uh, and it includes uh, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black uh, individuals, adults between the ages of forty and seventy-five. And so, for folks who are within that category, um, it may be a helpful um, prediction tool. Um, for folks who may not be within that demographic group, um, it. it it, there may be a possibility of over or underestimation of risk. There are other risk tools that can be used. And really, I, I present this information not to say, go ask your doctor for 
this specific risk tool, but to know that these risk tools are there to help decision making with regards to your cardiovascular risk, um, with regards to saying, okay, well, these are my factors in terms of my blood pressure, my cholesterol, um, uh, I'm not smoking. And based on what is seen in the population for these types of risk factors, this is the um, associated risk that is seen um, uh, with this set of, of risk factors. And it can give information about how we can modify those risks with medications or lifestyle changes. Um, uh, but what, one thing that falls short on these risk tools is that they cannot account for risk factors that are not captured within the source populations. And so um, we don't typically have um, risk tools that have included um, uh, women who are pregnant or um, the risk tool may include older individuals as opposed to younger individuals. And so all those different extrapolations um, may provide some um, uh, challenges for these risk tools. That is to say, this is all taken within the context of using this to inform um, uh, risk modification overall, but it may not be an absolute. So then that gets us to um, uh, coronary artery calcium uh, scanning. This is something that can assist with decision making for therapy for someone who, um, with one of these risk tools, was determined to be borderline or intermediate risk. Um, a coronary artery calcium score can then be used to determine subclinical um, heart disease. Um, it's uh, uh, something that's a, a low radiation test. It's easy, easy to do. Um, it does raise some challenges in terms of, um, uh, you know, if, if anything incidentally is found, that's something to discuss with your physician. Um, but it is something that can definitely help make and guide decisions with regards to should this person be considered for uh, a cholesterol lowering therapy um, in addition to what they're already doing for their risk factor modification. So tip number six in terms of um, our modifying cardiovascular disease risk using life's essential aids. We've talked about, we're gonna talk about eating better, being more active, quitting tobacco, getting healthy uh, sleep, managing weight, controlling cholesterol, managing blood sugar and managing blood pressure. We've hit on some of those already. So in time, terms of modifying our risk, um, increasing the amount of um, vegetables, plant-based um, uh, parts of our uh, daily nutritious intake really goes a long way in terms of um, modifying cardiovascular risk. If we can increase the number of fruits and vegetable diversity, whole grains, um, and uh, limit higher fat uh, processed foods, um, that can help us with regards to lowering our cardiovascular disease risk. If we replace saturated fats with unsaturated fats, limit the amount of sugar in our beverages, all of those things can go um, towards limiting cardiovascular disease risk and limiting risk for um, uh, uh, overweight and obesity and limiting salt within the diet can help with limiting hypertension. In terms of uh, activity, it's recommended that as adults that we have um, at least 150 minutes of moderate aerobic activity or 75 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity, and that we should be including muscle strength activity like resistance and weight training within that um, uh, activity quotient um, for maximizing our cardiovascular disease benefit. In terms of benefits of physical activity, we know that physical activity helps us maintain our ability to live independently um, as we age, and it decreases the risk of falling and fractures long-term. So in addition to our cardiovascular risk, which it does reduce the risk of dying from heart disease, we know that physical activity has these other extended benefits, um, reduce risk of high blood pressure, colon cancer, diabetes, um, can help reduce um, uh, chronic and disabling conditions, and reduce the symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, all of these are benefits of maintaining a physically active lifestyle. We talked about eating better, reducing um, from high to low level in terms of salt and increased blood pressure. 
In terms of managing weight, we know that 20 to 30% of high blood pressure risk is due to overweight or obesity. And so having a five to 10% weight loss can lower blood pressure um, in someone who's suffering from blood pressure. In terms of physical activity, inactivity increases our, our heart disease risk twofold. And so being physically active, getting those targets of that 150 minutes or 75 minutes of rigorous activity can reduce our risk by 50% in comparison to someone who's not maintaining that active lifestyle. Um, and having this uh, regular moderate um, activity can actually reduce our blood pressure by almost 10 millimeters of mercury, which is independent of any uh, uh, weight benefit that comes from the activity. In terms of um, lifestyle changes, avoiding um, excessive alcohol intake would be helpful in terms of maintaining a healthy blood pressure and um, also avoiding nicotine, avoiding smoking is helpful with regards to significantly lowering cardiovascular risk. Sleep is important. Sleep is something that I think um, women in particularly um, uh, suffer from not getting adequate sleep in terms of 50% plus of women within their midlife report sleep problems. Um, this study of the women's health across the nation um, looked at participants over uh, a long period of time, over 22 years, um, and they saw associations with cardiovascular disease for women who reported um, high persistent insomnia and short sleep times. And so uh, even when they adjusted for snoring and depression and other vasomotor symptoms, they still saw this um, bear out. So we know that sleep is important for cardiovascular health. Sleep is restorative. Um, and generally most adults need seven to nine hours of sleep to function well. Sleep also has other benefits with regards to um, decreasing risk for cognitive decline and dementia, um, uh, maintaining a healthy weight and, and um, uh, avoiding depression. So one thing that's helpful that I think that, uh, that the American Heart Association has, has put out is, as guidance um, is in terms of our digital lives and how our digital lives have expanded. And so recommendations to get good sleep are um, in terms of uh, building a habit of sleep hygiene. And that means turning the digital devices off or dimming them, moving that blue light away from you so it doesn't um, impact your circadian rhythms. Um, it's setting a time for you to sleep as opposed to just a time for you to wake and blocking out um, messaging and interruptions and distractions that will interrupt your sleep. And then the seventh tip is to modify our sex-specific risk factors. We've talked about um, uh, uh, the traditional risk factors and modification. We've talked about um, understanding our, our risk with regards to hypertensive disorders in pregnancy and how that can impact our cardiovascular disease risk long-term. Um, but it's important to also uh, uh, be considered for things to actually modify those risk factors. So for women who are... Um, who are pregnant, um, there are recommendations to, in terms of one, to consider low dose aspirin therapy um, to reduce preeclampsia based on someone's risk. And those, and those guidance have been released by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And with that, we'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Luzi. Wow, terrific information. On the aspirin, before we get started on, on uh, questions, but I hear this from a lot of people, um, you know, people think that maybe they should just take an aspirin a day. You know, I'm sure you've heard this, a baby aspirin a day. Is that, is that true? So this all comes down to um, someone's individual risk profile. So in the mm -hmm. case of someone who has known heart disease, specifically um, ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, um, in discussion with their doctor, they may have um, a reason to be on aspirin in that event because it's it's a form of what we call secondary prevention. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of primary prevention, someone who's never had heart disease and they're just taking aspirin to keep the possibility of it away, we've actually seen some data that there might be increased risk of adverse events like bleeding, especially in older adults. And so mm -hmm. Um, it's not something that um, I think we, that we would make a blanket recommendation for anymore. It's really specific to if you have heart disease. Right. 
Thank you. So basically, whatever your doctor tells you to do, that's what you should do. Correct. Yes. Get off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to jump in the questions. Are you ready? Okay. Um, okay, from Sherry. She'd like to, she would like to know, are there any statins or other medications that reduce HDL cholesterol in addition to LDL? So that uh, would help for dementia risks. Another, I think I'm saying this right. So recently her example was, you know, if you have high HDL, Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, is, is that reported to be a biomarker for dementia risk? Oh, it's high HDL, uh, biomarker for dementia risk. That's not something that I am per se familiar with. We mm -hmm. do from a vascular perspective. We tend to like uh, the high HDL, um, uh, and we use the statins in certain cases to lower the, the LDL, which would have maybe an, a more unfavorable risk profile, um, but I have not heard of HDL as a, per se a biomarker for dementia risk. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is from Katie. She'd like to know, since inflammation is a part of our coronary artery disease, why are anti-inflammatory anti medications a risk factor? Oh, good question. Um, so uh, anti-inflammatory medications... Um, uh, some of them do carry uh, a warning with regards to increased risk for, for people who have heart disease or heart failure history. Um, I think it, it, it has to do with um, the inflammation being a multi-systemic uh, complicated pathway and perhaps the, the anti-inflammatories that we commonly use on, um, uh, on the market, like NSAIDs, I think, which this question may be pertaining to, um, mm -hmm. may not target that particular pathway of, of inflammation, in which the coronary disease is, um, or heart disease is, is, um, uh, manifesting in. So, um, so that, that is true. We do not use NSAIDs as anti-inflammatories to treat heart disease. We have mm -hmm. increased risk with them. Um, but I think there is still opportunity to better understand inflammation in its role in heart disease, uh, uh, moving forward. Sure. I think in general, just trying to keep your inflammation down in your body, right? It's good if you can. Yes, if you can. And so things yeah. like the anti-inflammatory, like an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, mm -hmm. So that be helpful with, with that regard. Staying physically active can help um, uh, with that. Um, so I, I think there are ways to use lifestyle to target that. Sure. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from Dayton. And they'd like to know, are there ways to lower your blood pressure besides um, medication. I think the question they're trying to ask is even being on medication, it's not really lowering, um, their blood pressure. I see. So a couple of things, I think with regards to a lifestyle, um, uh, impact in terms of increasing physical activity can certainly help with blood pressure management. Um, uh, dietary, um, intake specifically with regards to sodium salt can help with blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, limiting alcohol can help with blood pressure. Um, uh, certainly stress control and meditation can help with blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, from anecdotally, um, uh, those would all be factors, but what we have seen is that um, blood pressure control can be a difficult thing and it sometimes does take multiple medications to have adequate blood pressure control. And so if, um, uh, if, if Dayton is finding that there are challenges ongoing, that would be a point of conversation with your provider, certainly to consider other blood pressure lowering therapies or combination of blood pressure lowering therapies in addition to aggressive lifestyle things like physical activity. Mm -hmm. and diet. Is it possible um, that, you know, you're on blood pressure medicine and you're doing everything possible and, you know, perhaps you, you may even have it in your family or may not, you know, genetically, is it possible that it just, you know, um, it is what it is and, um, you know, kind of try to live your life that way and not, not be so terrified by it. Do you know what I mean? That. Yeah, I understand what you mean. I, there are um, uh, 
so, there are in some cases um, other reasons, secondary reasons for the high blood pressure. And so mm -hmm. it should be evaluated um, uh, to, to be sure that, you know, that those have been considered. But it is, as you say, it's possible to have um, uh, a strong family history, have hypertension, be on blood pressure medications, and still um, uh, need to factor that in as a part of life blood pressure control management. Right. Yeah. Maybe just maybe just really uh, think about the sleep and mm -hmm. the diet and exercise and all that, and be a little bit more, you know, precise and proactive on that. But, Comprehensive. Um, holistic. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, easier said than done. That is for sure. <laughs> That's very right. <laughs> um, our next question is from Lee and does a vegetarian with an extremely high HDL and an autoimmune disorder increase the risk for cardiovascular disease? Um, does, uh, does a vegetarian, so the autoimmune disease can increase cardiovascular risk. Mm-hmm. Um, ha having a more plant-based diet can be helpful in reducing cardiovascular risk. Um, and so that, that's one where the cardiovascular risk may be tracking more so with their autoimmune disease. And that's mm -hmm. something where, um, uh, having multidisciplinary care between a rheumatologist and a cardio cardiovascular specialist would be very helpful in terms of determining how to modify risk in that particular condition for that particular individual but the plant-based diet always yeah. helps. <laughs> so basically anyone with an autoimmune disease is a little bit more at risk for heart there, disease. There can be increased risk, um, with yeah. certain autoimmune diseases, particularly lupus, um, yeah. uh, that mm -hmm. can cause heart disease. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ginger, her question is how concerning is a, is a low dystolic number? A low uh, diastolic number? Dias diastolic. I'm sorry. Not a physician. And I'm reading this and I probably should have my glasses on. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Um, so we take, um, we take blood pressure within the context of one, what is the underlying cardiovascular um, issue, if any, and then symptoms. So if someone is totally fine, they feel no symptoms and mm -hmm. they're um, bottom number is a little bit on the lower side, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. Um, it's more so in this case of symptoms of someone is lightheaded or dizzy or not feeling well that we um, work to investigate that a bit more. Sure. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have heart disease, just means could be many things. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Here's the question of the day from uh, Sonia. She'd like to know, so what are your thoughts on weight loss drugs like Ozempic mm -hmm. to, you know, combat obesity, but also then to handle um, heart disease? Mm -hmm. This is um, a really uh, timely question, I would say. Yes. <laughs> um, so um, within the last year, there've been several uh, cardiovascular trials um, that have been presented that have looked at um, uh, these classes of medications, um, uh, most recently presented in November, looking at um, uh, semiglutide in individuals who don't have diabetes. And we saw that there was decreased cardiovascular risk. And so um, I do think moving forward, these are um, medications that are gonna be considered in multiple ways. Certainly mm -hmm. um, seeing the benefit for people with diabetes and, and certainly um, individuals with diabetes need access to these medications. Sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, we are now seeing in the category of individuals with overweight and obesity, I believe in, in um, that trial, the BMI was 27 and above, um, that there is a cardiovascular um, benefit as well. And so um, I think they are likely going to be added to our armamentarium to fight cardiovascular disease in the, in the future moving forward. Right. But under a doctor's care, under a doctor's care. So I just, gee, I'm going to go get this and, you know, absolutely, absolutely under a doctor's care. Um, I, I should say one, as I said before, patients with diabetes do need access to these medications. And so of course. Um, mm -hmm. there are shortages that are happening <laughs> across. Yes. The I know it, it's, it, that's, Agreed. Yeah. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. 
Yeah. And then certainly under a doctor's care, because there are side effects that, that need to be monitored. The medications need to be adjusted. It, it needs to be under sure. a doctor. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, this question is, um, okay, from Susan. She would like to know regarding blood clots, what are the downsides to utilizing blood thinners? So um, if someone has a blood clot, especially if it's what we call a deep, um, a deep venous blood clot in a deep vein, um, the, the individual risk has to be discussed between that patient and, and, and the, their physician. If, mm -hmm. if it had a history of bleeding or any type of intracerebral issue. Um, however, the general recommendation for a blood clot is that they be treated so they do not um, become bigger blood clots and end up places that we don't want them like in our lungs. Um, and then that guidance is um, carried on for blood clots in other places like blood clots in the heart in the setting of a weak heart do treat those. It all comes down to someone's individual risk profile. If they've had issues in the past with bleeding, if they have a disorder that puts them at higher risk for bleeding, but that's how we consider um, risk benefit for blood thinners. Great, thank you. Uh, this question is from Catherine. Mm -hmm. And she'd like to know, so if someone is a lifelong exerciser and is not overweight, no history of high blood pressure, eats healthy, does all the right things, but has off the charts plaque, what can one do beyond taking a statin drug? So I think you're doing a lot of the right things in terms <laughs> of lifestyle. Really? Yeah. Um, so I, I would not undercount the benefit that you are actually giving yourself by having that type of lifestyle. Um, number one. Number two, um, the statin medication, and sometimes there might be consideration of adjunctive therapies with something called azetamide. Um, but under a doctor's care, if they, if they think that's indicated, um, that's an additional added um, a way to modify that risk. And then depending on family history, if someone's been tested for um, uh, other types of cholesterol disorders, there may be other medications that can be considered for individual patients at highest risk um, uh, for lipid disorders. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. So from uh, DC, is it true that, is it arterial plaques? Arterial. Yes. Arterial yeah. plaques. Is it true that arterial plaques are made of calcium, number one? Yes, um, there's calcification, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you have a high, strong family history of heart disease, should you take calcium for bone health, knowing yeah, so this is an um, interesting question. So if there is a deficiency in calcium, if there's osteoporosis, weakness of bone, mm -hmm. um, which the calcium is being prescribed um, under a doctor's care, that's that's one thing. Um, uh, I think try, just taking supplements to take them without, without a, um, uh, an indication or, or a deficiency that's being addressed may be less beneficial in that regard. Um, and certainly um, excess um, calcium is to be avoided as well. Okay, thank you. We've got about a minute or so left. So um, does having AFib increase heart disease? So AFib is, it is a form of heart disease. Um, it, uh, as, as I mentioned, up to a quarter of women can have it within their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And the important things to know about atrial fibrillation, one, the symptoms of it can be quite um, distressing and problematic, but two, knowing if you are in the category of individuals that need to be on a blood thinner to reduce stroke risk, because atrial fibrillation contributes to a significant number of strokes. Um, and so, yes, it is a form of heart disease and you do need to be um, under the guidance of a physician to determine if you need to be on medications to prevent stroke. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question here. Um, so you mentioned that um, the BMI is 25. Is that correct? Well, yes. They mm -hmm. would like it to be. Is that just across the board or is that really calculated by age or so no? It, so it is a, it is a generic optimal um, uh, based on uh, 
the population studies that we have. I think BMI is something that is um, a topic of conversation often because in, in certain um, demographic groups, communities, BMI may not be the optimal or only way in which we can consider um, uh, someone's risk profile. Um, yeah. uh, sometimes we'll use waist to hip ratio, et cetera, um, to determine excess risk. So yes, 25 is optimal across um, communities, but that's a an area of debate. Listen, thank you so much. Looks like we're at the eight o'clock hour and I would like to thank Dr. Luzzi for speaking with us tonight. And she has graciously, graciously agreed to respond to any unanswered questions that we've asked this evening. So in a couple of weeks, you'll receive an email outlining the outstanding questions and answers. And in the coming weeks, a video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. And if you've enjoyed, that's, I'm sorry, that's all under videos on demand. And if you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a women's journey for more information about our upcoming webinars, our podcasts, and our monthly emails. Thank you so much and have a great night.